Our topic today concerns the so-called fairness doctrine. Uh, we start free speech with the First Amendment that protects the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press, and then in the 1940s through 69 and thereafter, there was the Fairness Doctrine incorporated by the FCC that said that if speech or writings were filtered through electronic media, that they were not protected in the same way they would have been otherwise, so that if you expressed views, you had to carry the freight for expressing other people's views as well. That's a gross oversimplification, which I'm going to get by with. <laughs> We have three panelists who are going to discuss things in more length. Seton Motley is the Media Research Center's Director of Communication, contributing editor for Newsbusters Org. He's in charge of incorporating the many arms of the MRC into a proactive response to media bias and assaults on the First Amendment. Heads up the Free Speech Alliance. He's written, lectured, and been a television and radio commentator on First Amendment topics. Jamin Raskin is a professor of constitutional law at American University at the Washington College of Law. He's the director of the Program of Law and Government and its Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Program. He's also a Democratic State Senator in Maryland, represents Silver Spring and Tacoma Park, serves on the Senate's Judicial Processing Committee. He also has written and lectured extensively on First Amendment and related subjects, and I would say that if I correctly surmise the direction of my panelists, I may give him extra time for rebuttal because he may feel <laughs> as if he's facing a party in an amicus or something similar, intervener perhaps. Finally, Tom Hazlett is a professor of law and economics at George Mason University, where he also serves as director of the Information Economy Project. He's previously held faculty positions at the University of California, Davis, at Columbia University and the Wharton School, and served as chief economist of the Federal Communications Commission. He's the founder and principal of Arlington Economics, LLC, a consulting firm and a columnist for Financial Times, and has provided expert testimony for state and federal courts, congressional hearings, foreign governments, Department of Commerce, and lots of other tribunals of fact and law. With that said, I will not take up much more of your time. I'm going to give about six or eight minutes to each of the panelists and then give some response time, as is appropriate at that point, and then eventually we'll get to letting you ask questions from the floor. We're beginning then with Seton Motley, be followed by Damon Raskin, and followed eventually by Tom Hazen. Good afternoon. He says eventually, I guess he thinks I'm going to prattle on a bit. Um, the not much. Not much. No, no. Um, <laughs> as uh, the good judge said, the First Amendment is the preeminent freedom. Uh, it's constant in the Constitution. Um, you look at the history of the Fairness Doctrine and look at the history of governmental regulation of radio. The Fairness Doctrine is not the beginning. Is not the alpha of the way the FCC or previously the Federal Radio Commission handled uh, the First Amendment uh, and the issue of free speech on the airwaves. If you go back, I, I've done some history research of the 1926 debate. I'm not going to belabor this too greatly, but I think there's some very interesting quotes from the floor debate in the House and Senate uh, in the 1926 discussion of the creation of the Federal Radio Commission and the Radio Act of 1927. And if you just pick them out of a lineup, you'd think they were said Thursday instead of 80 years ago. Um, they brought forward the Federal Radio Act uh, to control the bleed over between ship to shore communications and, uh, and broadcasting on the airwaves. Um, at that point, that was all they were looking to regulate. There was some positing of a censorship doctrine, a fairness doctrine then, and it did not get ensconced in law, neither in the 1927 Radio Act or the 1934 Communications Act. Um, in 1926, Maine Republican Representative Wallace White said, we are dealing here with a new means of communication. 
It is fighting to develop its usefulness in field which telephones, telegraphs, and cables are entrenched. I want to say that they had a lot of competition just like now. Radio has a lot of competition for the, for the, air, the eyeballs and, and ears of everybody. He continued, we should exercise every care in the public interest, but there exists a reasonable doubt whether we are justified in applying this to this industry different and more drastic rules than to other forms of communication are subjected to. The pending bill gives the secretary no power of interfering with freedom of speech in any degree. Uh, an opposing view from Democrat Luther Johnson said, equal facilities and rates without discrimination shall be accorded to all political parties and all candidates for office and to both the proponents and opponents of all political questions or issues. Sounds an awful lot like the Fairness Doctrine. However, at the end of the day, the Radio Act passed and the only equal time representation in the law was for candidates given airtime, not ideas. Equally in 1934, there was debate again for some sort of Fairness Doctrine-esque regulation. The, at the end of the day, the uh, same language in the 1927 Act was re-ensconced in the 34 Act. They debated a, a Fairness Doctrine and they did not make the final bill. So that's twice now when the, the American people's representatives had a chance to do something about this, they didn't do it. What happened was the Federal Radio Commission and then in 34 the creation of the Federal Communications Commission started doing it unilaterally without consent of Congress. So it, it never really had the legislative authority to do what it did until it eventually got to 1949 when they created the Fairness Doctrine. As far as its effect on the industry, it was in place from 1949 to 1987 when it was rescinded 4-0 by Reagan's FCC. In 1987, there were 125 talk radio stations in the country. This week, there are more than 2,000. So to say that it had a stifling, silencing, chilling effect on free speech is more than an understatement. Uh, what we've seen is a blossoming of the discussion, a blossoming of the, the practice and the exercise of the First Amendment, not just on radio, but the 22 years w with which we've had to work with these new ideas being given a new forum have opened up a whole panoply of other venues that probably wouldn't exist or certainly wouldn't exist to the large and effective degree they do now as a result of the recension of the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, you've got Fox News, you've got internet with all sorts of things. The internet would have come along anyway, but the point is there is a whole array of views now and you can certainly, one of the arguments against the Fairness Doctrine was the scarcity of, of broadband, of, of broadcast licenses. Uh, I think we've seen over the last 22 years an explosion of sources, not a scarcity. And as Representative Wallace White said in 26, you should not apply one set of rules of free speech on one, one venue and, and different ones for everyone else. So there is no need for a fairness doctrine. There is no need for any sort of regula regulation of speech at the FCC on broadcast airwaves. Um, going forward, I think we need to be vigilant against that, against media diversity, against localism, which is a whole other mess which we may or may not get into. But I think, to, in closing, I think the left knows the jig is up on the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, I think they've moved on to these other regulatory ways to arrive at the same destination as the Fairness Doctrine, but the principle remains that they want to shut down voices with whom they do not agree. So uh, I want to thank the good judge and uh, I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Jamie.